Okay, thank you. So, plant lovers and conservation lovers, I think we should all pay a visit to their uh, conservatory or to their institute. So, um, I wish we could have listened to him more and more, but um, since we had the time constraint, I'm so sorry our speakers had to rush after time like this, but as I had said in the beginning, it's a very big opportunity for us to be having such eminent speakers, so I wish speakers wouldn't feel the time rush so much, all right? So I'm sure we'll be happy, the listeners will be happy to whatever you are going to present. And um, uh, Dr. David, his humor has met this session, not like a post-lunch session. <laughs> has been a very uh, enjoyable session. Now we come to the next part, the fourth presenter. Now this will be an online presentation. It's a special paper presentation in commemoration of Azati Ka Amrit Mahotsav. That's elixir or nectar of independence festival. That's how it is. So this will be presented by Dr. Mahendra Prakash online, and he will be speaking on perspectives on social justice today and Amit uh, Atma Nirbhar Bharat. Please tell me I am available to audience. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, yes, so uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, giving me opportunity to present my opinion on uh, perspective on social justice today and Ask Nirbhar Bharat. That is the title that I am going to present. First of all, I would like to thank uh, members of the organizing committee, organizing secretary, co-convener, convener of this college, of uh, Fazal Ridge College, for organizing such a wonderful seminar on India's extended neighborhood. And in between, college also managed to commemorate Ajadi Kamit Mahasso and uh, a special lecture, uh, two special lectures has been, uh, has been planned in this event. So the topic that I'm going to present, I would like to repeat it. Uh, please listen to Perspective on Social Justice Today and Ask Nirbhar Bharat. That is the title that I'm going to present. So uh, as we know that uh, India is also uh, facing the many situations like societal hurdles and economic development. But we can say that India's growth is very much progressing in these days and this progress has been converted into the social demand, social issues that social issues must be uh, adhered with the justice. So I would like to say that uh, the social justice is not a very uh, common thing. Social justice is vested in society and that is very much needed for the society for overall growth of the nation. So the term social justice implies a political and cultural balance of the diverse interest in society. Social injustice cannot be tolerated for a long period and can Damage society through rewards, therefore, that the private class should be made capable of life with dignity. 
So social justice is very much needed for fair conduct and equitable status of individual, as you can see on the PPT. Social justice is necessary for social unity, political or economic progress at the individual level as well as for the nation. Eliminating the inequalities rooted in the social, economic and political life of nice individuals for socially unprejudiced society is very much needed. And uh, this is also vested in our constitution. So why India needs social justice? India needs social justice, uh, as you see, historically diverse class, usually caste. The caste system is present in India and there are such categories and caste that they are humiliated and they feel that their representation is very less in the service, in the people's representation and in the industries, in the wages, in the labors. So, this social justice is very much needed for this country like India and uh, economic equity in society and strengthen democracy. Economic equity is needed in society to progress for the society and democracy. That democracy we are enjoying in India, the largest democracy in the world, that should be more strengthened is strengthened in the term of social and the communal hormonal base. The representation of individuals, those marginalized in various fragments of social and government institutions should be represented equally. Social justice process involve caste, class, gender and other that should be taken into consideration and involvement of every eligible individual in national role that much required for the social justice. So social justice that I have already explained and why social justice is important and it is vested in our constitution as well. Article 14, Article 15, Article 16, Article 54, Article 16.1, Article 16.4, Article 46, all articles are very much associated with the social justice and in the favor of the depressed, backward class, women, race, caste, sex, people, place, whatever that is that is very much challenging for the, the social unity should be, must be united and must be given chance to grow and to grow of the nation. So social justice is very much needed and we know that India is also, uh, India have faced this in this COVID-19 period. India faced a very much problematic situation that uh, was unavoidable. But our Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi has came up with the plan, the Art Nibar campaign on 12th May 2020, that was very much uh, pioneered with the economic development, economic development with the self reliant India. As in this slide, you can see that a call from Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi, on 12 May 2020 during COVID-19 epidemic for the self reliant India. He advocated five pillars for our Nirbhar Bharat, that is economy, infrastructure, system, vibrant demography and demand. A stimulus package for business, MS, MEs, poor includes farmers, agriculture, new horizon of growth, government reform that has been taken into consideration in this Aapnirbhar Bharat Abhyan that is called campaign, making India drive skill development and startup and Aapnirbhar Bharat Rozgar Yojana. That is the main agenda that India is now working on it and they are, uh, all agendas are basically very much uh, linked with the economic growth, linked with the social harmony, social unity, social growth and individual economic gain. So, Atmanibar Bharat stands for self-confident India, amid the economic improvement of India to tolerate the global challenges. The government has chosen self-sufficiency as one of the vital tools. Atmanibar Bharat campaign was introduced to make India self-independent. The concept is to back up the economy's major sectors, making India more involved and 
an important part of the global economy. The initiative to fly aiming the outbreak of COVID-19 to ensure the prompt availability of the necessary medical aid from within country. The concept expanded to granting enough support to various sectors to bring the Indian economy back on track. You, everybody experience uh, to this COVID pandemic phase and India's economy was very much slow down at that time. So after India's most remarkable Sudeshi movement of Nirmar Bharat Abhiyan is currently in the limelight. During the pandemic, Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi has announced, as I told, in May 2020, he announced that idea of making India never with an initial package of 20 lakh crore, which was equal to 10% of the country's GDP. The package was introduced as an investment towards curbing the challenges faced by the Indian citizen during the COVID-19 pandemic. Recalling the devastation in Kutch after the earthquake, Prime Minister said, through determination and resolve, the area was back on its feet. A similar determination is needed to make country self plan So this Abhinavar campaign is for us. He said that self plan to India will stand on five pillars, as I already mentioned. And he also said that a special economic package that is for Abhinavar should be given to the various sectors to improve themselves and make India a progressive country. Post the massive unexpected disruption on human life caused by the global pandemic, the year 2022 was the community once again picked up the threats and took a small step to get back to a semblance of normalcy. However, the challenges Caused by the aftermath of this crisis, subsequent waves of the pandemic and the ensuing Russian-Ukraine conflict have impacted the global as well as India development trajectory. There was a stress on the key aspects of social well-being of citizens such as health, education and social security. So this Aapnevar uh, Abhiyan is very much important for us. Focus on long-term goals of human development and Sabka Saath Sabka Vikas have assumed salience. The social sector expenditure outlay of the central and state government has increased steadily to stand at rupees 21.3 lakh crore in fiscal year 2023. With its share in total central government expenditure standing at 26.6%. So our member campaign is very huge and it is continuing with lots of social and other industrial sector that uh, they are getting benefit from it. So our member Bharat and national growth, uh, here it, uh, we can see in this slide the economic package that I have already told you that 10% of the equivalent of GDP and package was 20 lakh crore rupees. So in that package, there was a support to PMJ GY women account holders. That was the package that was disbursed in June 2020 and the disbursed to 2.81 crore per older person and 17.8 lakh crore rupees for front loaded toward payment of the first installment of the PM Kisan Yojana and support to 1.8 crore for building other construction workers and 24% of EPF contribution transferred to many employees and rupees 9700 crore rupees transferred to bank under PM UI and this has helped PMUI means Prime Minister Ujjala Yojana and this helped the poor people to get benefit from it. Our member Bharat and National Growth as uh, this slide indicate that facilitative legal framework will be created to enable farmers to engaging with processors, aggregators, large retailers, exporters and fair transparent manner. Risk mitigation for farmers, assured returns, and quality standardization cell from integral part of the framework. 
so that is helpful for farmers as well so atmanirbhar campaign is very much helpful for the india's strengthening economy and social strengthening by giving opportunity to depressed people and poor people helping them to stand with development of india so india's union cabinet on june 3rd 2020 approved the farming produce trade and commerce promotion facilitation ordinance 2020 and this was very much helpful in atmanirbhar abhiyan and this abhiyan has taken uh, into consideration so uh, the economic progress that can also uh, be discussed here that how the economic progress we are now looking at it so there are uh, many uh, agencies who came with their data and said that average growth of india's gdp is 6.9% in fiscal year 2023 because we had faced lot of problem during the covid uh, 19 pandemic time and uh, the economy was very sluggish and the reform was taken and this reform process is also the part of the atmanirbhar abhiyan and we are steadily getting over it and we are progressing very fast so this atmanirbhar abhiyan has really uh, done a very good uh, job in terms of economic development societal growth and uh, the national overall development and performance so economic progress in india at present you can see the percentage of people multi nationally poor and deprived so that is the data that is economic survey i have uh, took it from uh, there and uh, you can see the nutrition child mortality mortality and years of schooling school attendance cooking fuel sanitation drinking water electricity housing assets all are very much came down from earlier 2015 to 16 to 2019 to 21 so we are progressing in these areas and we are doing good as a india as a developing country so social participation and atmanirbhar bharat according to the 2011 and 12 nsso statistics the share of wage laborers among scheduled caste was 63% 40% 44% for obc and 42% for upper caste and 60 Uh, 46% for others. So this NSSO data has been not been changed as, but it is progressively indicating that in 1993 the ST unemployment data, unemployment rate was 4.2 and SCs was 8.2, OBCs was not available and others was six. So in 2011 and 12 it came to decreasing and it at present we can say that uh, employment exchange statistics in 2018 the sc has the application for the employment exchange statistics in the uh, uh, employment bureau office the sc whose applicant was 16.7% and they got the uh, opportunity to be employed st was 25.7% to men in our category for 1.55 crore as the applicant and they were the applicant and they are seeking a job to be uh, get in involved in the progress of the economy and get benefit as a individually with the help of salary and other packages placement by category sc uh, in 2019 sc 4.9% uh, was the placement was there Scheduled tribe was 11 percent and OBC 0.9 percent. In total application that was received in 1.1 crore. So why I am showing this because this this social participation and Atmanirbhar Bharat is correlated with each other. Social participation, social justice is very much necessary because if social justice is there, society is very much uh, strengthened. Then Atmanirbhar. Can Bharat campaign can also be a successful follow up from the Prime Minister, and it will be uh, likely to be more beneficiary and beneficial to those who are very oppressed, depressed, and marginalised sections of the society. 
so the society if society is getting a larger part of share from atmanirbhar bharat then social justice is there social justice is not uh, only the constitutional thing social justice must be implemented implemented through policy plans and economic policies development and uh, participation from the uh, these such categories yes cst obc general uh, ews is there and women so government policies for social justice that is not very new but uh, it is there and policies and they get fund from the government and they are running their projects to upliftment the these such categories that very much involved to uh, do their best at the social level and perform good at the economic level and good participation they are in political participation and they are participation in the business economy and everything so a scheme for economic development is there that national uh, backward class finance development committee entrepreneurial scheme credit enhancement guarantee scheme for scheduled caste national scheduled caste finance and development corporation uh, body is there a scheme for assistance to scheduled caste development corporation body is there self employment scheme for rehabilitation for manual scavengers pradhan mantri daksha aur kushalta sampann hitagrahi yojana pm daksh is for the sc st and the those who are manual scavengers these plans are there that uh, is uh, very much helpful for economic development of such caste such uh, class that is uh, they are the citizens of india so we the government and uh, the anybody cannot ignore and the social justice is very much needed and atmanirbhar bharat is doing uh, good doing good thing for them it can uh, schemes for social empowerment schemes undertaken by nbc of dc for promoting social empowerment that is backward class uh, uh, social empowerment centrally sponsored scheme for implementation of the protection of civil rights act 1955 and then again this amended in 1989 pradhan mantri aadas grama yojana is there support for marginalized individual for livelihood and enterprise smile plan is there pradhan mantri ansuchit jati abhyudaya yojana pm ajay is also there so these yojanas these plans are there and these plans are very much under the justice ministry and empowerment ministry and this uh, plan is very much beneficiary for those who are socially backward and economically uh, poor so at uh, if we go further like atmanirbhar bharat and how this social justice is very much correlated with each, with each other so objectives are there that i have found it that is strengthen the manufacturing units salaried employees workers and contractors through various relief measures raising funds to uh, uplift the weaker sections including under privileged people small vendors street vendors migrant workers and small farmers to ensure self sufficiency in various agriculture sectors and other sectors like animal husbandry fishery dairy reinforcement of the major critical industries such as defense production minerals space sector atomic energy sector infrastructure power production and distribution units air space management sector coal through fund raising and relief measures so this is the uh, atmanirbhar bharat main agenda main objectives and the point to that uh, is in blue if you can see it the raising funds to uplift the workers weaker sections uh including under privileged people the small vendors street vendors migrant workers and small farmers that is very much important for the social justice and atmanirbhar abhiyan atmanirbhar campaign is doing for that and social justice is coming to the ground and people are getting benefit from it however we can see like i am working presently in sonbhadra district uh, in uttar pradesh very south and east uh, of the up and i found this district is very uh, poor people are very poor there is no electricity no sanitation no water uh, pure drinking water and uh, no road so 
this kind of areas are there. Even in uh, areas you can find in Jharkhand, in Chhattisgarh, in remote area of Madhya Pradesh. So, how this Atmanirbhar Bharat campaign and how this the plan and policy this is uh, implemented since independence and constitution provision is there. But uh, there are certain areas that is uh, the development and uh, the policy is not pleased to there and they are lacking with it. And uh, so this is very much harmful for the Atmanirbhar Abhyan or whatever Abhyan that is uh, central government or any government is going to implement. So social justice uh, is not up to the mark and social justice is not up to the point that uh, is very much necessary that is need for an hour to consider it to the people that they are living in such areas where there is no electricity, no water, no roads. So social justice is very much needed and these areas must be taken into consideration for their development and economic development so they can get benefit from it through employment, through education and through other means that uh, provided by government. So overview of our Nirbhar Bharat campaign, how we can see the overview that campaign, campaign uh, which has begun in uh, May 2020. So government has announced for Manrega scheme it, uh, the monetary fund was allocated like 61,500 crore in 2021 budget and in May 2020 allocation to the scheme was increased by 65%. So Manrega's fund was increased. Additionally, under the Prime Pradhan Mantri Garib Kanyani Yojana, Manrega base also been increased from 182 rupees to 202 rupees per day. Under Ujjala scheme, 4.43 crore beneficiaries were recorded in May 2020 and 1.82 beneficiaries, beneficiaries in June 2020. National education policy was uh, implemented in July 2021, but uh, it uh, came in 2020. That uh, is a very much uh, important for education sector. Pradhan Mantri E. Vidya Yajna is there, digital education. And uh, when we talk about digital education, uh, the areas that are very much suffering in remote areas, they don't even have the connectivity of 4G. And uh, we are talking about 6G uh, technique. So that should be uh, researched and that should be found, uh, that should be found that why these are the plans that government that the, at the center is uh, implementing and it is not coming to the uh, real way, like not at the ground, that people will get benefit from it. The cabinet, uh, the next point, the cabinet approved the Pradhan Mantri MSY means much Vikas scheme, that is June 22 provide 11,000 uh, crore rupees for marine inland fisheries and aquaculture and 9,000 crore for developing infrastructure such as fishing harbors, cold chain and markets. Pradhan Mantri Kisan Samman Nidhi PM Kisan scheme aims to provide income support of rupees 6,000 per year to farmer families and in 2021 uh, it was rupees 17,891 was dispersed to 8.94 crore beneficiaries like small farmers. Farmers are categories, everybody knows that small farmers are there, big farmers are there. Uh, so, the next slide is social justice today and Atmanirbhar Bharat, the disparity. How the social justice we can see today at Atmanirbhar Bharat campaign that is continuing. The economic progress and social condition, there is disparity is there. India, as uh, uh, somebody was telling, I think Dhananjay told that uh, India's economic progress is very much high. And uh, uh, in the GDP ratio and purchasing power parity, the, we are at the world uh, number three position. But uh, the social condition remains the same in some uh, part of the India. We can see and uh, we can observe that. The mapping the gap, regional gap, regional gap that I am talking about, if we take the example of like where I am from, where I am speaking today, a Sonbhad district, and we talk about Lucknow and uh, Ghaziabad, there is a gap, regional gap. The gap is 
in the education gap is in the social uh, sector development gap is in the the technological advancement road everything we can find it so this uh, thing must be taken into the account and uh, that is uh, needed that to be uh, needed to be there, that these things and these points can be uh, done uh, good in the manner at the time in the coming days that these areas also get benefited from the such schemes and uh, they can contribute their uh, uh, what you can say their workforce the workforce that is residing in this area they can contribute to the economic growth of india the marginalized uh, are two types the marginalized socially marginalized and poor marginalized and economically marginalized people are poor people are socially marginalized that should be taken into consideration women in terms of population ratio and beneficiaries that uh, is there women uh, workforce is very much very much less than it compared to other like uh, european countries and other world advanced nations we are very uh, women only few uh, areas in uh, india where the women are contributing much through their employment through their skills but in uh, uh, state like uh, bihar uttar pradesh madhya pradesh and himachal pradesh uh women condition are very poor and i think the north is doing best uh, in terms of women contribution to the employment and women are contributing their best to their development to the economy to uh, their states so urban and rural again there is a division urban urban is industrial and rural is farming so the farming is also Uh, getting hampered by this climate condition and they are not getting good price their resale price urban industry they are doing good through industries so there is a gap between urban and rural so uh, the social justice that is needed that should be needed in all the way that, that disparity should be removed and our rural bharat campaign must be go uh, in with this uh, the problems and the, this abnormal health can be a solution for these problems so in conclusion and conclusion i would like to say that uh, social justice is a continuous process supported by government policies abnormal health campaign is linked with development of individual belong to lower income group and employed socially backward seasonal farmers rural women through intense and vigilant policy framework from government and third point is conclusion uh, that empower social class certainly strengthen india in every aspects in the phase of azadi ka amrit mahotsav and after so this is my conclusion that i have found so thank you very much for uh, listening uh, patiently and uh, uh, now uh, i would like to stop here and thanks again to this fazal ji kadesh to give me wonderful opportunity again once i spoke at the international seminar in kolkata thank you very much or right. uh, esteemed participants that was dr mahendra prakash head of the department department of political science government post graduate college opera sonpatra up thank you dr Mahendra for a very enlightening talk on the economic policies that India has adopted in order to achieve social justice and a self-reliant and stronger India. We'll skip with the question answer session for this and the next one because our scheduled time for the uh, final program we have slightly overshot it. So, um I hope the speakers will not mind for that or do or apologies for that. So now we have the final speaker for this session that is Professor Atongo Ovang, professor and head Department of Sociology and academic coordinator for Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav Nagaland University. Lumami Nagaland he will be presenting his uh, talk on contribution of the tribal heroes
towards India's independence. So, Dr. Ovang, please take your time. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Respected chairperson, thank for the time. It's a pleasure and a privilege for me to be here in this uh, gathering of uh, academician scholars from uh, across the country. Uh, for giving me this uh, privilege, I must thank the principal and his colleagues, not forgetting the organizing committee, uh, Mr. Sel, so leading by the convener, thank you so much for giving me this privilege again. Unlike other speakers who have uh, did or presented on research best, I'll be sharing something which is not new because to make this uh, conference successful, one has to say something on this Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav. Anyway, joking apart, when I was requested by Dr. Benry Paran to say something on this particular topic. I took it as a challenge, not as a subject expert, but as a uh, young academician or as an academic coordinator of a NU, for which we have recognized laws of program in collaboration with the uh, National Commission for Scheduled Travel. We also organized a DPED in, uh, say, like uh, Jan Jayati uh, Diwas. Then we also organized. Uh, uh, unity work, we have also make a webinar, we also organize a, a say like a um, lecture series, like many things, okay, and it will continue till this August of uh, 2023. This is what we have been doing, so as I said, okay, anyway, according to the time schedule, I can hardly say thank you because we are, as what our uh, chairperson has said, we are running behind the time. Anyway, as we all know that the last speaker again happens to be the most boring speaker also because of the dime. Uh, okay, anyway, having said this one, may I have the liberty of uh, requesting you to bear with me if I start my presentation in this way. Uh, the present generation, uh, which we often know as the alpha generation or say like the E generation, and in this tough competitive world, the youth of today generationally generation hardly have any time to uh, remember the rich cultural heritage of our country in this context under Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav. That is nothing else but contribution of tribal heroes in freedom struggle. This was initiated by the government of India to celebrate and commemorate the 75 years of Indian independence and the glorious history of its people, culture, and its achievement. This is the main team. The main aim of celebrating these 75 years, that is Mahotsav, is to create a vision for India in 2047. So the Mahotsav has been celebrated on the basis of five pillars, that is the uh, struggle for independence, that is ideas of 75 years, the achievements of 75 years, the actions of 75 years, and the resolutions of 75 years. So the, I will right away share something which, what in this way that the freedom we enjoy today is not because of just but a handful of people worked for it for a long time, for a long, only a selected few were highlighted and glorified for being part of the freedom struggle, while many great leaders and heroes who have played significant role were ignored and were forgotten. There was hardly any mention of tribal leaders, heroes or icons who fought long battles to get this country from the clashes of the foreign rule. There is a need to highlight the stories of tribal heroes and heroines from the freedom struggle to and, and to introduce them to the new generation so that their, their sacrifice to the freedom struggle will not be forgotten uh, and to get it noticed. Tribal heroes, 
not only contributed immensely to the freedom struggle, but also made an important contribution to the protection of water, land, and forests. Many tribal movements in India rose in repellence against the British because of their cruel as well as destructive inroad into their territory and ways of life. The tribal people, as we all know, used to live in a peaceful and in tune with nature for hundreds of years before the arrival of the British forces. The revolutionary movement and the struggles organized by the tribal communities were marked by their immense courage and supreme sacrifices. The tribal with simple weapons like spear, dows, fought fearlessly and violently, which is the only method of resistance against the mighty British with full organized force. The British treated India as a colony and tried to maximize benefit from India through the use of Indian uh, resources for personal wealth creation. With tribal region being among the naturally most gifted region in terms of mineral resources, it is natural that the Britishers to interfere in tribal affairs. Because of these exploitive interferences, number of movements were initiated by the tribal leaders and people, many of which form part of Indian independence struggle, or say like struggle for Indian freedom fight. It started in 1768 when the tribe of Utisha fought against the British under lo local king Krishna Bhaja of Bamsha. Indian freedom struggle was strengthened by several movements by tribal communities such as, as we all know, that Sandal, Kons, Damars, Gols, Bills, Kasi, Mizos, just to name few. Many tribal leaders like Birsa Munda, Dilingana Gariya, Buddha Bhagat, Kunda Dor are some freedom fighters and tribal leaders who protest against British rule in India. Just to name a few, as I said, like Birsa Munda was an Indian tribal freedom fighter and a folk hero who belonged to Munda tribe. He spearheaded a tri tribal religious movement that arose in Bengal presidency, now Jharkhand, uh, in the late 19th century during the British Raj, thus making him an important figure in the history of Indian independent movement. Alori Sitaram Raju, known by the local name as Maniyam Virudu from Andhra Pradesh, how the tribesmen stand united against the British and draw them gorilla tactics so that they could defend themselves. Another one, Dilingana Gariya, inspired the local people in Chutanagpur region to oppose British brutality and <coughs> injustice. We can see from Jatra Bhagat was an Indian freedom fighter and social reformist. He also is also founder of the Dhana Bhagat movement among the Orient tribe. He fought against the tyranny being carried out by the local zamindaris and authorities. Residents and repellents are viewed as flashpoint in the history of colonialism. In this context, if you see from the context of Northeast India, as well, it cannot be explained just by a single factor, as they frequently drew on multiple discount, discontents. Some took up arms with an intent to overthrow colonial rule. Some refused to pay taxes. Some refused to get recruitment in colonial force, and so forth. The first anglo Burmese war that is uh, 1824, lead to the signing of Treaty of Yandabu, 1826, was the beginning of British baremuncy in the Northeast India. However, it was not an easy dust of East India Company in their venture for bringing the entire region under their control. Steve resistance and repellence against the East India Company 
mark the era of the rule. I would also like to name some few tribal leaders and chief in Northeast India who fought against the British, such as Yu Dirot Singh from Meghalaya, Yu Ging Nakwan from Jandia Hills, Ba Thongan Sang Sangma from Garo tribe, Dai Gamti from Arunachal, Vantula from Mizu, that was a Loshia, that then, then Tangal from Manipur. One can also see hostile situation prevailing in Naga Hills throughout colonial era, protecting their land from the foreign invasion. We come across like Gugi revolts in 1917-18. So tribal leaders like Jandung Nang Malamai, a spiritual and a political activist, then uh, Gandinlu, by my properly known as Rani Gandinlu, joined the Hiraka movement in 1927 with the intention of ending British control. As I said in the very beginning, these are some of the tribal leaders and chiefs who contributed to the freedom fighter against the British. So to shorten my presentation, last but not the least, Insurrections and rebellions are the method of tribal communities to fight against the unjust and high-handed rulers and authorities to get justice for themselves. Thus, the tribal leaders or unsung heroes directly or indirectly provided huge contribution in the national movement for the liberation of India from foreign domination and hence nation building Efforts of the tribal's communities cannot be ignored. Uh, before I leave, I thank the organizing committee for giving us this uh, wonderful uh, presentation, food for arranging everything and making this conference successful. Thank you so much. Well, I hope. I don't think there is. Any, anyway, if there is anything they want to ask, of course. Of course, it's not us two, the botanists have said, nothing related with our team of today's conference, but if there is anyone who can ask. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Obang, for your very enlightening presentation on highlighting the unrecognized heroes. So with that presentation, or pep pepper presentation on India's extended neighborhood converging interests that, that is concluded. Once again, I thank all the presenters for your wonderful talks. And it was a very varied, very diverse session that we had. And I believe this was a session in which we were able to achieve common ground, that is the theme of our conference, common ground for cooperation and progress together amid all the competition, the conflicts, and the troubles that face us. Yet, we continue to endeavor towards cooperation and searching for common ground together so that we can grow stronger together. Thank you all very much. With that, this session is concluded. We have a few minutes break. After that, the valedictory session will commence. Thank you.
very good evening conference organized by the research and development cell Fazal Ali College on India's extended neighborhood converging interest 2023. It has been a day long conference and it has really, I'm sure, ended on a very grand note with full scholarly pomp, presenting unending possibilities, paving way for collaborative research, effective communication and partnership, converging interests and merging of different fields can surely help in achieving incredible goals. So with that, I would like to invite Dr. Akam Longchari, publisher, the Morong Express, Naglan, to give the concluding observation, to give their way forward, and maybe takeaways from this conference. Am I audible? Yes. Uh, Madam Chairperson, leaders of this institution, thinkers, scholars, uh, my dear friends, it's a privilege for me to be here in your midst. Yeah, it's been a long day, and I know that many of you must be anxious to get home. I've been tasked uh, the responsibility of giving uh, a closing observation and after hearing the perceptions, thoughts, analysis, I think you'd agree with me it's a pretty vast area that we're talking about. It's interdisciplinary. Uh, many have spoken and focused on the macro and sometimes we do get lost in the macro because it's too vast. And here we're living on the ground. So I've been taking notes, trying to discern what would be useful. Just some immediate impressions before I give some kind of a response. Can we imagine a different kind of format that will actually lead to dialogue. And, and this I leave it for you to think about. Can we imagine a different kind of format that will actually lead to a dialogue and not just monologues? <coughs> when we touch foreign policy, sometimes it becomes very mechanical. It becomes even very technical. And perhaps the decolonization, decolonizing process is returning in the 21st century. 
not in the same way that it happened in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, but in today's world, in today's context of the 21st century. And so when we think of policies and foreign policies, how can, how can it be consistent with values of humanization? There's something that comes to my mind. And so I just want to weave some of these thoughts, call it observation, but I know there can't be just one observation, there will be many observations, and it's not possible to give all the observations, but perhaps a kernel, the kernel of some of the issues that were raised today. And we'll not get into specifics, but just general conceptualizations, and weave it into my own perspective. I come from a perspective that is rooted in conflict transformation, social change, and so that is my bias, so to speak. And so it is from that place that I try to make sense of what was shared today. So allow me to, you know, uh, perhaps a response. So let me begin by saying, we live in an interesting age. Since the end of the Cold War, the world went from a bilateral world to a brief moment of unipolar world. And today, we are in a period of a multilateral world dominated by various middle level powers, dominated by middle, by various middle level powers, each different from the other, and yet each seeking to assert and establish its own sphere of influence. Amidst the uncertainties, what is certain or what remains certain is the fact that the world is no longer neatly divided. And in the midst of this series of transitions that we see and we have lived through, at least for those of us who are a little older, an interchanging power dynamics have been occurring during this period of time. But in that vacuum, in the vacuum that emerges with these transitions of power dynamics, the phenomenon of the individualism, the phenomenon of individualism has taken shape. And by individualism, I'm not talking about traditional individualism that, that most of us have learned as students and as thinkers and scholars. But this individualism that we see growing in the vacuum has the belief it has the power to determine and overcome circumstances and forces of faith. By faith, I mean F-A-T-E, faith. So the kind of individualism that we have today has this growing notion that it can overcome the forces of faith. And when I say individualism, it means human beings as well as the state. Because humanity was divided, was dichotomized into two perceptual categories, the state and the human being. Or at least that's what James and I would say. So in, in this world of increasing possibilities, this may be true to some extent for the global elites, where men and women make decisions for themselves and their interests with growing ease and with the belief that everything, that everything is possible. These behaviors have increased the growing assumption that reality can be engineered 
by just individuals. The assumption that reality can be engineered by just individuals. This conviction, however, is neither shared, nor is it true for most people living on the ground, simply because this assumption ignores local realities. This assumption ignores local realities played out through the interplay of history, politics, and geography. In other words, the history, politics, and geography of a local geographical reality provides opportunities, as well as limitations and constraints to the world. They provide limits and constraints to the world. Well, it is true that technology and communication have revolutionized human interaction and enabled more and more people to be interconnected and interdependent. This implies that each geographical place affects and impacts where every other geographical place like never before. There was a time that the region, commonly now referred to as the Northeast, I don't know, when I was growing up, uh, you know, I did my BA, my LB in DU before I went for further study. Northeast was a term that we would not hear very often. And this was in the 90s. Mid late 90s. I was in Delhi. We, we rarely use the word northeast, the term northeast. It was always where you came from. And so when I went out to do my further studies and I came back, it was almost like a, uh, you know, it was a different world. Because now everything was being defined in terms of northeast, which I found very strange. So anyway, there was a time that the region called the Northeast did not matter. And it was alienated and isolated. But in today's world, the Northeast does matter. In fact, every place and region matters and can be strategic. If the Northeast can converge its interests by embracing its rich cultures, consolidating its human energies, harnessing its natural and energy resources, and we've heard various speakers talk about this, empowering its market and entrepreneurial capacities, developing its intellectual knowledge system, and building institutions, building institutions that respond to its needs. It is not difficult to imagine a Northeast whose influence will be much bigger than what it looks like on the map. For a moment, I just want us to imagine that. A Northeast whose influence is much bigger than what it actually looks like on the map. But to do that, some form of rethinking needs to take place. Some kind of reimagination, I think, is very important. And so this means getting a finer and nuanced understanding of the region and its extended neighborhood by studying its history and politics, which essentially are rooted in geography. Robert D. Kaplan, and may, perhaps many of you may have heard of him, a writer, uh, uh, a traveler, and he explains geography not in the sense of map, but geography where the map is merely the starting point to investigate trade routes natural resources, environment, climate, group characteristics, cultures, and the experience of a people in a certain landscape over a period of time. In a sense, the common experience. Geography as in the common experience, where the interplay of all this, the forces of history and politics come in to interact the different facets of life and nature. Human experience informed us that history does not repeat itself, but it does inform and instruct us. 
history does not repeat itself, but it informs us, it instructs us, it familiarizes us, and above all, it cautions us. With this, I want to briefly touch on three broad areas of common experience. And these are the kernels that emerge for me, you know, the various points. And here I'm talking from the point of the Northeast, you know, rather than spreading out too vast and too thin, because I think it would perhaps help us to think a bit more further. And this is vital because they continue to inform and shape public policy. These three areas that we're going to touch upon is important, is vital, because they continue to inform and shape public policy and relationships in the region. First, history. History in this geographical space has often been written by the powerful and the victors of war. This in turn means that boundaries, and let's remember that boundaries are concrete expressions of history, that boundaries were randomly and arbitrarily draw, drawn and redrawn by the powers, colonial and post-colonial, for their own conveniences and interests, negating the existing ancestral boundaries shared between neighbors. In this way, the natural and innate relationship between people and land, which cons constituted a people's understanding of a dignified existence was severely impacted, and the ability to be stewards of its resources was compromised. Just a month ago, there was an indigenous team that came from the Amazon. They were here in Mokchong as well, or so I'm told. And Part of the reflection, they said, oh, Nagas, you seem to have lost your relationship with your land. They made a number of observations. They said, oh, you know, we observed during our time here, during our study here, that Nagas seem to have lost his spirituality. And yes, also his relationship with the land. And when we lose the relationship with the land, we're no longer makers of our own culture and land then becomes reduced to a commodity. And for people like us, whose identity is intertwined with, with our land, because everything revolves around the land, that separation between, that separation of relationship between us and the land has actually taken us to a place where we are looking for answers, a state of confusion, so to speak. Second, one needs to ask the pertinent question, did tribes, did the concept of tribe exist between, uh, bef sorry, exist before colonialism? Did the concept of tribe as we understand it today exists before colonialism. And as scholars and thinkers, I would urge you to really think about it, to explore about it, because this is one of the languages that emerge, emerges in true policies after policies. And today, even our festivals we are reduced to living museums, so to speak. But we leave that for a different day. So did tribe exist before colonialism? This is a rhetorical question that the Ugandan political commentator, Mahmoud Mamdani, asked. Tribe, he's, he's saying, he answers his own question by saying, tribe is an ethnic group where a common language existed but tribe as an administrative entity certainly did not exist before colonialism. Tribe as an administrative entity did not exist before colonialism. 
And that's something that I would really encourage us to think about. I say this because tribe as an administrative entity was central to colonial rule. It was a construct of colonialism, colonization and affirms the view that colonization was much about colonial conquest through military, economic, and political power as much as it was the production of an archive of and for whom. The construction of tribes as an administrative entity and developing colonial knowledge was crucial to establishing anthropological view. Unfortunately, till this day, this colonial construction and production of knowledge forms the basis of organizing power, territory, interest, and our relationship in the region. I think this is at the heart of many policies and questions. Because when others try to understand who we are, they turn to Hutton's and Mills. Don't you think it's time that we define who we are? I'm not saying that we must do away with it. But I think we need critical examination. Because a region that was isolated and alienated is suddenly now at the fulcrum of many things. And since people don't have time to come and understand us, and we to understand them, they will read books. But many of us don't write about who we are. So it is easy to turn to what is available from an outsider's perspective. And so that becomes the information on which policies are formed and also how we are defined by the other. So I think in the 21st century, it has become so critical for us to engage and to understand colonial knowledge. And this is something that I felt kept coming through the presentations, at least from my point of view, in the context of social change. Third, the geographical space, starting from the chicken's neck, extending all the way to the Burma-Thai border. It is entrapped from the time of colonization till this present day in an unending cycle of conflicts. An unending cycle of conflicts interrupted only from time to time with brief moments of relative peace. One of the, I think, the presentations, I think it was the online, mentioning about how Burma is, you know, has so many, uh, has rich quote unquote ethnic groups. Well, if you look at it from the chicken snake right till that Burma Thai border, you see many groups, many people's groups. And here, here, I just want to make a segue. Uh, as a student, you know. I think one of the terms that, exist, uh, that emerged out of the post-Cold uh, post War was something called ethnic conflict. And as a student of uh, conflict, I found that very difficult to understand. Because, you know, and we hear it, we, we ourselves now have started using these terms, ethnic conflict, or there is an ethnic conflict. In my mind, I don't think it's really about ethnic conflict. It's about resources. It's about power and so on and so forth. But once we label it as ethnic conflict, then it's very difficult to find resolutions to it. Because when you define it as ethnic, you're actually talking about someone's identity. And it's very difficult to negotiate with identity. So redefining, the rethinking process, I think, must engage with all these different aspects. And so the peace process in this geographical space, this space where there's been unending conflicts, 
has been bogged down by the old school template, which is not only state-centric, but reflective of a dogmatic, bureaucratic, coercive, manipulative, divisive, patronizing, and monocultural process. There are six narrow solutions without making concessions or conceding rights. In other words, the state approach is one of conflict management, not conflict transformation. And I think here one of the speakers kept mentioning about how it's about management. And really, when you look at the different peace processes, it, is a, it has been about managing the conflict and not really finding resolutions or transformations. And so by managing conflicts, it induces conditions for short-term peace while undermining long-term peace. This means creating entrenched situations of neither peace nor war. So there are many places, and perhaps observers would also say, Nagaland today is a place, the Naga context is a place where there's neither war nor peace. We are caught in that entrenched situation. However, for sustainable and enduring peace, a new visionary template is imperative. And this has geopolitical ramifications. This new template must be intercultural, inclusive, participatory, engaging, trusting, political, ethical, respect, respectful, and reflect moral progress of the principles of common and shared humanity. In a sense, a template that unlike that, sorry, in, in a sense, a template that unites and partners in addressing the root causes of conflict and resolving it on the principles of justice and rights of all peoples. These three broad categories that I've just briefly reflected upon demonstrates how historical, political, and geographical forces continues to inform and shape policy. It also helps us to understand why there continues to be an erosion to establish any real institutions that functions and contributes to the crucial aspects of just peace, substantial democracy, and effective governance in many, in many parts of this region called Northeast. And I think a lot of our speakers have highlighted about democracy, about development, uh, about governance, and the fact that institutions are not working. Question about roads. A trip from Jorha to uh, Mokchong taking seven, eight hours. I just came up from Dimapu yesterday. It took me about seven hours. Uh, you know. Uh, so the, f the failure of institutions. We don't have real institutions that functions and contributes to the crucial aspects of effective governance and substantial democracy. So it calls for a new vibrant public discourse. That is the trust of what I take from this conversation. Because we had a lot of conversations today, not really conversations, but perceptions and perspectives were shared. It could have led to conversations, and perhaps if they did lead to conversations, some of these issues would have come out more clearly, because here you are talking about at a macro level, now when you come down, you get the macro to the ground, these issues will emerge. And I'm so thankful for our friends who have traveled from outside of the region to explain the broader vision, if I may say so. But how do we connect it to the ground? And we are the ones living on the ground. We are the ones who are defined by our local realities. And so for us to participate in this kind of engagement, we need a process of rethinking. So that we're not parroting what others are telling us, but we're sure of what it means. So that in mutual respect, we can engage into a dialogue to take this forward. And so, I, 
I noted it down as reimagining interest. Where the Northeast has been called the gateway, the land bridge, uh, to break artificial political barriers, uh, forge new relationships, uh, so on and so forth. But how do we actually reimagine interest? So I've noted a few points. The, inter the interplay of history, politics, and geography needs to be respected. The projection that peoples of the Northeast are a byproduct of geography is erroneous. In reality, they, we, are a part of history, politics, and geography. History needs to be defined by the peoples of this region for our own purposes. And the policies, whether it is the ACTIS policy or the other policies, needs to interact with these histories. These policies need to interact with these histories, understand these histories, so that it does not remain aspirational, but reflect a robust post-Cold War engagement and a decolonized relationship. Reflect a robust post-Cold War engagement and a decolonized relationship. Two, a process of genuine dialogue at the people level to address meaningful questions of institutionalized state boundaries and shared ancestral boundaries with the intent of converging interests by re-establishing dignified relationships, develop critical solidarity, and imaginatively create alternatives. This means engaging with ideas about the future with diverse people who don't agree about everything. Essentially, it means forming relationships that help overcome fears, self-interest, and pride. And believe me, a lot of policies around the world are based on fears, self-interest, and pride. So how do we engage in a dialogue that helps overcome fears, self-interest, and pride? But it means that we must be willing to engage in the process to talk about the future with people who don't necessarily agree with you. And sometimes, as you well know, we like to talk only to people who agree with us. Will we have the political courage and political will to talk to people who don't necessarily agree with us? Third, make a paradigm shift from conflict resolution to conflict transformation, which involves reframing of issues, building trust and confidence, rebuilding society, addressing burdens of a violent history, holding to account the violation of rights, initiating processes of trauma healing, and creating solutions based on justice so that long-term peace is possible. In a sense, it means creating. It means creating non-Westphalian solutions. I really appreciate if we can understand together. Creating non-Westphalian solutions. Because when we look at the history, geography, and politics of this region, right till the Burma Thai border, I think it demands not non-Westphalian solutions. And I think out of that process, it would make the subcontinent even much more stronger. But the idea of non-Westphalian solutions is something that it must grapple with. And I think we need to engage with that. 
support this nurturing strategic relationships of cooperation and converging interests. This needs to be an outcome of an organic process of identifying shared core, core values and understanding and respecting each other's cultures, worldviews, and knowledge systems. I mean, how, how does a country enter into a strategic relationship, not just a tactical relationship? In the course of conversation, there was talk of democracy and how you know, different forms of relationships are entered into. But really, if, and you know, it came up several times, the notion of peace. And if the notion of peace is to triumph, then, then it needs strategic relationships, not just tactical relationships. And to do that, we have to go beyond interests. We have to go to the core values. But core values take time. And in this world of market forces, time is not a luxury that one can dwell on. Because getting to the core values take time. And so it's easier to focus on interest. But again, if we talk of long-term peace, I think that's where we need to focus on. Fifth, to invest in developing institutions having historical, political, and geographical relevance. This goes to the heart of self-governance that is centered on people and improving their quality of life. This will ensure that the people of the region are no longer spectators, but become spec actors by taking ownership of the process and becoming involved in decision-making processes that affect the future of the region. So for me, just by way of listening those are the five suggestions very broad suggestions some may say it's too maybe idealistic some may say it is too long term it is not immediate but i think if we are talking about real real future and progress of the region we have to think in terms of decades not years We have to think in terms of UK, and not just one year to two years to five years. Finally, in conclusion, and this is an observation again that Robert Kaplan made, and it's quite an incisive observation. He says one of the issues of Asia, in fact, the issue, Asia is not about ideas. It is about nationalism. It is a fight over territory, over natural resources, and who controls what. I don't know if that is an observation you would agree with. And I'm sure everyone would have a response to that. But I would like to think, if at all, there are elements of truth in that, that Asia is not about ideas, it is about nationalism and territory, fight over territory, and who controls what and who. It's all about power. I like to believe in this reimagination, rethinking that the Northeast can change this. So, can the Northeast become a region of birthing ideas? But for this, we need to decide to stop being a victim, stop the politics of victimhood free and heal ourselves from being addicted to the pains of the past. And so we need to focus on the hope of the future and to invest our energies in building them. And a, a number of you kept talking about future, future. We are good at identifying problems and sometimes we do not always agree on the way that we define the problems. But I think we need to find ways how to move out of those problems. And so, by way of observation, 
and a response to this gathering is the need to begin a process of rethinking. Yes, all these things are there. The activist policy and the extended neighborhood and so on and so forth. But for us to be equal participants, for us to participate strategically, we need to be free. We need a new imagination. I would say the people of this region should be leading this process. So that we're not just spectators, but we become spec actors. And so, change is relationship center that begins in nurturing relationships with ourselves. We don't bring change on the basis of changing content or altering policy alone of winning an argument or even by winning an election. Change begins by working together, guided by self-determining values of a shared humanity. When we look at this region from the chicken snake to the Burma Thai border, and you remove all the political boundaries what do you see? Remove all the political boundaries. What do you see? And what kind of future can you imagine? So on that note, I would like to conclude that hopefully this discourse would would inspire a new imagination. But really, we have to change the format of this conversation. We can't have monologues. We have to have a dialogue. I want to really thank Benri for inviting me. I'm coming back to Faisal Ali after 20 years. I think the last time I was here, I came to do a workshop. I was still a student then. I'm still a student today, so it's good to be back, just to even see Faisal Ali grow and evolve in the last 20 years. But really, I think you can do much more and you should be doing much more. I think the critical consciousness needs to stem out of this process. So I want to thank Ben Bree for inviting me. I was not sure I could make it uh, down with uh, cough, you know, and in today's time, it, it means many things <laughs> and it can be interpreted in many different ways. You know, so I just want to thank you for your patience, really, just through the day. I think a lot of you have been consistent, patient, listening in, you know, and uh, yeah, so thank you so much for this time and thank you so much for your patience. Thank you so much. Thank you for eloquently interweaving all the wide-ranging discussions and presentations we've had today. Um, you've surely given us a critical consciousness, a bolder vision to find a way forward. Uh, we will now have the conference report in charge documentation committee ICIENCI -E 2023. I would like to call Ms. Badangsunla, Assistant Professor, Department of English, to give the report. Uh, thank you for the time, Chair. I'm not Ms. Badangsunla, but uh, on behalf of the on behalf of the uh, documentation committee, uh, I will just make a brief report of uh, today's event. So, uh, yeah, International Conference on India Extended Neighborhood, Converging Interests, uh, was held on 23rd March 2023, sponsored by uh, ICSSR and uh, organized under the ages of uh, RDC, Fazalali College. 
we had uh, six sessions and uh, uh, we had uh, 10 invited speakers including inaugural keynote special presentation on Azadi Ka Amrit Mohasaf and uh, concluding remark and as well as uh, sub-team speakers and uh, of the 13 paper presenters uh, we had five presenters uh, who presented online so basically it is a hybrid mode today today's even uh, paper presentation and uh, sub team covered diverse areas such as uh, Indian foreign policy, Lukis policy, Ekis policy, uh, biodiversity issue, ethnic issue, uh, border and geopolitics, etc. Uh, we had uh, all together four moderators that had uh, led the different technical sessions, presentations, and two chairpersons on uh, uh, different sessions inaugural as well as uh, uh, conclusion. And also we had special presentation from the Cultural Club of Fazal Ali College. Uh, all together we have uh, 95 registered participants, both uh, on-site and online. We have only 10 online uh, registered participants, but all together 85 plus 10, we have uh, 95 participants. So that is all about uh, today's event in brief. And I would just uh, like to mention uh, that Professor Iman has uh, donated uh, this copy, pre-release uh, copy, which is releasing tomorrow, his publication, and it did a book to our library. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry for that. That was Dr. Thieu Ben Tang, uh, Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science. We will now have the presentation of certificate, in, uh, certificates in charge reception committee. Um, now I would like to call Ms. Yashikala, Assistant Professor, Political Science, to do the honors. Respected Chairperson, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the reception committee, I take the honor in presenting uh, the certificates to all the paper presenters. In all, we had 13 presenters, uh, both online and offline. But to save time, I will not read out the names of the online presenters. As I read out the name, I would request you to come forward and to give away the certificates, may I request of Principal, sir, to kindly. Dr. Bipentam. <laughs> Mr. K. Nokmarimba. Dr. Aulumla Bongwaner. Dr. Deepa K. Baskar. Mr. B. Tiatamse. Dr. Suraj Berry. Dr. R. Bandang Tamjin. <laughs> Mr. Chongtam Kunan Mani.
Dr. Giron Mo Chitai. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, and yes, uh, participation certificates are also ready. So all the registered participants, you're requested to uh, collect from the reception counter, which is set up at the lobby of uh, this conference hall after the session. So thank you. Thank you all for your participation. I would now like to call Dr. E. Benry Tang Patton, co-convener, ICIENCI 2023, to say a few words of appreciation. Thank you, Ma'am Chairperson, for the most hated time, the session that's given to me. I, will, I would like to say uh, thank many individuals uh, institutions and society, but uh, I will uh, confine to a very general way. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank our Almighty God for giving us this beautiful opportunity. Uh, it has been my prayer uh, the day, the year that I was uh, uh, appointed as a member of the RTC. We serve an institution hardly for 30, 32 years. Uh, I was reminding myself uh, with my colleague and with my wife that I have just left with 12 years of my service. So uh, 10 years, it will just pass like that. So before my retirement and superannuation, when we are here in the institution, because we know that our best time, our human lives in the 20s and 30s and 40s, we spend in the institution. So uh, wherever we may be, uh, whatever means that we can, we will try to, we try our best to contribute. So uh, this is a very humble arrangement and a program and an assemblage of many people. We would like to have many such occasions and programs in the years to come. So I believe this is not the end. This is not the uh, concluding part, especially for the invited speakers and the paper presenters, uh, that please invite us in your institutions, in your college, in universities, wherever you are. Uh, we would also like to uh, pay a visit, present a paper, likewise, uh, whatever we have uh, in, the, in the future, in the days to come, we would like uh, to see your faces again. So let not this be the end of your show here in the college. Uh, the conference journey has been very long. We started uh, last year in the year, uh, year after the lockdown, and then few of us, my colleague, we started with a concept note. So it has been almost, uh, almost a year that we conceptualized this conference. So I wish and I believe that uh, tonight I'll be able to sleep probably after so many, so many months. So I thank especially Dr. Pyobin, my HOD, and my former HOD, uh, Amungla and Jamir. Three of us, we conceptualized on this international conference. So I'm very indebted and thankful uh, again and again to them. Uh, the, the conference has been uh, scheduled last year actually, but we postponed, as many of the, my friends and paper presenters will know, we had to postpone because of the a little delay from our uh, granting authority. So uh, we are here, we could have successful uh, conference uh, program. Originally we proposed for two days, but uh, they sanctioned us not even 40% of the, the, the budget that we proposed, so we could have only one day. But uh, I'm very thankful for the beautiful journey that uh, we have seen. I'm especially uh, thankful to my team for the RTC and as well as the organizing committee. From day one, since last year, from the month of June, we have been driving this journey. So I'm very thankful to the RTC and my organizing committee. Uh, I would like to pinpoint uh, particular names on uh, Professor Tamjan Sosang, uh, Professor Tafiki, Professor Lahiri, Dr. Tripathi, Mr. Rana and his wife, Dr. Mahendra, uh, Professor Atungo, uh, Dr. David, uh, Dr. Likase, uh, for giving your, your time, your precious uh, expertise and sharing to us in this college. Uh, I also would like to especially thank the 13 paper presenters, both online and offline. It's because of your participation that this program could be successful. So I'm very thankful to the paper presenters. And uh, 
I also would like to acknowledge the presence and the task that has been given to the chairpersons, to the moderators and their reporters. Uh, they have done a very beautiful job. And special mention to the, uh, my colleague, Mr. John, and his uh, friends, the Systems and Information Committee, the Sound System, and the IBC. It's my team again, so I'm very thankful to them. It is only because of them we could have the flawless uh, uh, coverage and the upload of uh, different uh, media, so I'm very thankful to them. And again, my students, uh, who has uh, sang so beautifully, the cultural club, I'm so thankful to them. It was uh, a little bit sudden that we gave a time to the cultural club, but they have beautifully, our students have beautifully sang, so I'm very thankful to them. And most importantly, uh, our uh, granting authority, that's the ICSSR, uh, they have been uh, communicating to us since last year, and they've been acknowledging our mails, our letters. Even today, they've been calling our principal. Uh, uh, for your information, we have not really received the the budget that have uh, awarded us, but till today they have been calling our principal, and then they have, uh, yeah, they have sanctioned, they have given us sanctions. So we are very thankful to them. We will send an acknowledgement letter to that, and also uh, we would also like to thank our higher education department. Uh, unfortunately, because of the assembly session, our additional director and HOD could not be here. So uh, in their absentia, uh, in his absentia, we are very thankful to him as well as to the our department, our higher education department. And uh, of course, uh, our principal is here. Uh, we all know that our principal is uh, a very different principal. Uh, he stays, he comes, he'll be the first one to come in the college and he'll be the last one to leave the college. So uh, he's like a friend, my brother, my uncle, my teacher, my advisor, my principal. So I'm very thankful uh, for uh, our principal say for all the things and all, all the encouragement and all the advices and all the resources that he have provided some of our colleagues will be a little surprised. Uh, we changed the setting of the conference, and suddenly it's like a studio. Uh, we, we cannot imagine that such kind of a stage and a lighting will be. It's only because uh, of our principal said that a beautiful stage and an environment could be set. So we are so thankful to him. And uh, one, another special mention is to Professor Zjamo Yantan. He's a professor at uh, School of Social Sciences, IKNU in Delhi. Uh, I've been in touch with him. Actually, we started with him. He gave him uh, us an idea to uh, propose to the ICSA for such kind of funding. So I'm very grateful to Professor Zjamo. And uh, our, our friend, my brother, Oti, uh, he told me not to call him brother, just call him a name, but I wanted to call him Oti, uh, Dr. Akum Longchari. Like he has mentioned, uh, way back in the year 2003, when I just joined in 2002, our political science association, we organized a workshop on Naga, uh, conflict resolution. So, like he mentioned, 20 years. Uh, that day, that year we met, and just today only we are meeting. So after 20 years, uh, we are meeting. So I'm very thankful uh, for such a beautiful statement and a concluding remarks and observations and the challenges that he has uh, given to us. So I'm very thankful. And uh, yeah, I may not be able to mention each and every uh, department or committee, but uh, in case I have missed out others, uh, I'm so thankful to them, so apology if I have uh, mentioned, not mentioned the names. Uh, like our principal has uh, mentioned in the uh, welcome address, if there is any limitations, uh, this much, this far we could uh, give you whatever we have, the resources, our college, our infrastructure. So if there is any, uh, any limitations or anything that we have missed out from you, uh, do, giving to you, we uh, say an apology uh, to you. And uh, lastly, as I've mentioned, we don't want to just uh, uh, conclude in this way. It's a first international uh, even in a program in a college. So we don't want to conduct uh, after five years or after 10 years. We want to have this uh, annually or regularly. So please uh, share your ideas, especially the invited speakers and the paper presenters. Your ideas, your suggestions, your invitations to your institutions will be very helpful for our college. So we will keep on uh, collaborating with you in the days and in the months uh, to come. And the last but not the least, I uh, will wish uh, your safe travel to the uh, other invited speakers, those who are outside Mohokshung and outside uh, our state. Uh, we will keep you, remember you all in, your, uh, in our prayers, and thank you so much.
So we know how much has gone into the making, organizing of conference of this scale. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Benry and your team for this really magnificent job. We are all really happy and let's all give a big round of applause once again. I would like to conclude with uh, what uh, J.K. Rowling has once said. We do not need magic to change the world. We carry all the power we need inside ourselves already. We have the power, maybe that can be political power or ethnic or environmental or even green power like our sir has mentioned, to imagine better. Thank you so much. And now please don't go away. We have uh, something very important. We have a photo session and everyone is tired, but you can put your best foot forward and the best smile too. And then that will be followed by high tea. Thank you all. Here? Okay. So the photo session is going to be here.